Greetings, viewers, and welcome to my humble abode. Anyway, hi, my name is Anders, and I created this channel back in August of 2014, but I didn't upload my first video until December. When I created it, I knew that I wanted to start making videos, but they were to go with my instructables at the time. My goal wasn't to create any particular type of content, or form an audience, at least not here. I thought that by creating videos, I could add another dimension to my do-it-yourself guides, and I did. I also use the channel as a place to dump random videos that I put together. I did this for about a year and a half, then I started creating the type of content that I produce today. Outside of YouTube, I work a full-time and a part-time job, and I just recently went pro as a mountain biker, eating up what little time I have left. Usually I only spend a few hours a week editing, and I would love to spend more time working on videos, but with my current schedule, I simply don't have the time. I consider this a hobby and I don't expect to make any real money off of it, but if you like this channel and you like what I do and you want to support it, then I have a Patreon account where you can do that. Currently I have no supporters, so <laughs> you could be the first one. Imagine that. On Patreon I have two tiers, a $1 and a $5 one. For $1 per video you get to be a peer reviewer. Not really, but kind of. You will receive early access to all of my videos before I release them. I will be uploading videos on Thursdays because this is statistically the day when most people are on YouTube. However, instead of waiting to upload on this day, I will upload the video as soon as it's done, and the following Thursday I will make it live. From the point of upload to the point of release, you will be able to watch, comment, and like before anyone else. If while watching you find a mistake, you will be able to notify me and I will be able to correct it before it's released. In a way, you'll be part of the creation process and you'll be rightfully thanked as a supporter and, I suppose, co-creator at the end of each video. The other tier is a $5 one where you'll be able to get everything in tier 1, but you'll also get to direct the content of it. If there's a topic you want me to cover or a video you want me to make, then I'll do it. I think I might have already mentioned this, but this will be on a per video basis. How I think that works is you sign up for Patreon, and once I post, that amount that you have pledged will be transferred from you to me. So now that all of the shilling is out of the way, we can get into my plans for the future of the content of this channel. Not too long ago I was feeling pretty down because the rates I was getting views and subscribers was going down. I was growing, but not as fast as I wanted or had hoped. Meanwhile, many other people who I consider close friends were exploding in views and popularity. The reason why my growth had slowed, at least in my opinion, was because of my upload schedule. I simply wasn't uploading enough for the algorithm to take my channel seriously. Obviously, no, that's not the case. I think what's happening is YouTube has changed the algorithm once again, where it favors content that is longer and more spaced out. Or perhaps the algorithm automatically just fits the desires of the collective zeitgeist on this platform which would mean that people have become tired of the rapid video releases from others and are seeking out longer, more in-depth videos to spend their time watching. I'll upload new videos every month, or try to anyway. I'll also try to create shorter videos which require less research along with the longer ones. So most likely alternate from month to month, so yeah. I'm going to be doing more camera work with skits and costumes and weird lighting with a green screen. Actually, my next video will have quite a lot of that. It's gonna be awesome. Finally, I'll do my best to stay connected with my fans. I'll try to respond to as many comments as I can. I now get over 10 per day, so that's much harder than it used to be. One of my goals with this channel was to form a strong community, and one of the ways I plan on doing that is with Discord. I don't know much about it, but it's what all the cool kids seem to be doing, and it's a great way to communicate with your fans and make sure that those who want to see your videos get to. I've heard a lot of rumors of YouTube hiding videos in favor of others in some people's subscription feeds. I haven't experienced this myself, or know anyone personally who has experienced this, but I have seen it in my analytics. People don't seem to be watching my videos when I release them. So maybe there is some validity to this claim? I've never really given in to the YouTube is against us conspiracy theories, and I have viewed most of them as just hysteria. But if this one is true, then I want to make sure that you all get to see my videos when they are released. Join my Discord, link below. Also, uh, follow me on Twitter while you're at it. 
I like it when people interact with me. It's fun. Speaking of communicating, a few weeks ago I asked for questions and you guys delivered. So let's do it. here in front of me. I'm going to do my best to answer all of them. We'll see how this works. 4chan or Reddit? Neither. When did you first start mountain biking? Six years ago because of girl. What was first, the chicken or the egg? Neither, because evolution happens extremely slowly and the parents will always produce offspring, which are more like them than not. Imagine a series of pictures taken in chronological order. If we select two which are extremely close to each other, they will look more or less the same, and everyone will agree that they are chickens. But if you go further back, the less alike they become. There is no real point where the egg became the chicken, or the chicken created the egg. So to truly answer your question, the chicken and the egg emerged at the same time, when the first human said, there be a chicken. Honest thoughts on the alt-right. They are fringe fractured and ultimately failed political movement full of thoughts. What was your favorite subject in school? Ooh, I had many favorite subjects in school. Uh, probably anything STEM, uh, but if I had to choose, it would be science. Definitely science. Use a furry? No. But if I understand this correctly, the furry community formed from science fiction communities in the early 80s, which is why they exhibit similar behaviors such as cosplay or the creation of original characters. Uh, personally, I've never really been a big fan of sci-fi. <laughs> So, whether it be in the form of books or movies, it just doesn't entertain me in the same way it does for others. So I have no real reason to partake in any sort of group activity or assign myself with an e-label that signifies me as an extreme fan of that sort of stuff. And to be clear, I'm not just talking about the furries, I'm talking about all the groups that seemingly obsess over a certain genre or a specific trait. We'll, we'll, we'll call it geek culture or simplicity. In this case, it being anthropomorphic animals. I can appreciate art if it's done well, but that goes for all genres and categories of art. Just as an example, I think concepts like steampunk or cyberpunk are actually really cool. Um, but I wouldn't tie myself to any fandom or group surrounding that. Now, if, if you want to partake in one of these groups, then that, that's great. I'll, I'll power to you. But that sort of stuff doesn't really interest me at all. Even slightly. <laughs> but uh, to really answer your question in all forms of the definition of what a furry is, I can assure you that I am not. What are your hobbies? Do you play chess? Besides biking and making videos, I am what is known as a maker. I love to build things, uh, anything and everything. And I've been that way as long as I can remember. Um, I think it may have had something to do with the fact that my sister forcefully prevented me from playing games or watching cartoons. Uh, and and this, this forced me to seek out other forms of entertainment. So when I was really little, what I would do was I would go into my room and I would tear things apart and put them back together. And then using this knowledge to design and sometimes create contraptions that someone at my age probably shouldn't be making. I, uh, I would do that until one of my parents or friends dragged me outside to play, often involving biking, which could explain my other passion. I don't get to make as much as I, I used to because of my lack of free time, but I, I get to create videos like this one, which gives me the same thrill. I'm actually uh, currently working on a 3D printable violin, which I'll make a video on when it's complete. It won't be done anytime soon though. I'll be moving at the end of December and I have a lot to do between now and then, but it's coming. It, it, it's definitely coming. That's, that's something I'm excited to get out. It, it probably won't be as popular as any of my other videos, and I doubt any of my viewers would actually be interested in watching that, but um, I mostly make it for you know, me. And then your other question was, uh, do you play chess? I do, <laughs> and I, I'm quite good. At least, I like to delude myself into believing. Do you play chess? Maybe we could play against each other sometime. Is homosexuality common in children, or will they grow out of it as an adult? Okay, so my camera died halfway through answering that question, so I wasn't able to get it on camera, so I'm just going to answer it while recording. 
So, first off, it depends on what you mean by children. If by child you mean prepubescent, then the answer is no. If a child claims to be homosexual or heterosexual, for that matter, they are lying. No one will feel any sort of sexual attraction before reaching sexual maturity. During, they may start to swing one way or the other, but this is no predictor of one's sexual interests or desires. Now, if you're talking about teenagers, then that becomes a bit trickier. If I understand the question correctly, you're asking if these people who are homosexual will grow out of it. Perhaps in reference to the spike in homosexuality in recent years. People don't grow out of their sexuality, they grow into it. So after puberty, you're set. You're stuck as whatever you end up as. And that's not a bad thing. And don't ever let anyone convince you otherwise. Maybe a better way of answering your question is like this. We know that there are many gay people who are forced to repress their sexuality to conform to the expectations in a social group, such as a religious one. Considering that, it's entirely possible for the opposite to occur, where a straight person will lie about their sexual orientation and proclaim themselves as a polyglamorous trisexual to avoid being socially ostracized as an evil, privileged hetero. I'm sure something like that is extremely rare, and when compared to the number of people like Ted Hager who constantly talk about what the gays do in their bedrooms while being caught doing the exact same thing later, it's, it's practically non-existent. I hope that answered your question. I'm in love with you. Do you have a girlfriend or boyfriend? Nope. I am currently single. Congratulations, mate. So what's your biggest passion in life? What made you a content creator on YouTube? Well, thank you, John. Uh, my biggest passion in life would have to be making things. And I've been making videos for a while, I suppose, because it is just another medium to create things. Will you do any non-controversial topics to lure in and then convert more mainstream viewers? Oh, absolutely. Um, a video I've been working on for years now, uh, I plan on releasing around Halloween, and it will be titled We Are Becoming Ghosts in Our Machines. It will be about how the media that we produce can serve as sort of a fingerprint for you, and can be used to essentially make a virtual copy of you. Be sure to watch out for that at the end of October. I'd love to do more videos like that one. I'd also like to do a video debunking less controversial things like Bigfoot or alien sightings, you know. Super basic stuff like that. I don't know. Um, since I didn't make this video with any core theme, um, I have a lot of freedom to branch out and kind of do what I want with it. So, yeah. Given the evidence accumulated by psychologists resulting in the APA and DSM-5 recognizing non-binary dysphoria, do you still stand by the two genders on the grounds on average gray and white matter levels? They can be changed by reading and playing games. So the difference isn't as clear as earlier papers thought. Alternatively, is there anything you changed your mind about in the past few years due to research? <sighs> so this is a bit of a difficult question to answer, but I'm going to do my best. First, I'd like to see the evidence that you say has been accumulated by a psychologist. I've been told that it exists, but when I request the papers or studies that provide that evidence, these people either don't reply, tell me that it's easy to find and I should look it up myself, because quote, I'm not your research assistant. <laughs> Seeing that you didn't provide any, I'm kind of left scratching my head. You also say that this has led to the DSM-5 and the APA recognizing non-binary dysphoria. Uh, the DSM-5 is a manual for the diagnosis and treatment of mental disorders. Uh, it, it only speaks about gender dysphoria and makes no mention of non-binary dysphoria, as you put it. Gender dysphoria has been well documented, and we even discovered the mechanism by which it occurs. The human brain, like that found in many other species, is sexually dimorphic, and sometimes during the early stages of development, uh, the wrong brain can form in the wrong body, resulting in a great deal of discomfort for those who suffer from it. The, uh, the rates of suicide amongst the trans community is some crazy number, like 46%, which is why it's so important that they seek help with their condition. Uh, unfortunately, not a do. Now, I was able to find a fun, colorful fact sheet from the APA, which clearly says that very little research has been done on the non-binary community, and most of what is known from most of what is known comes from personal accounts of lived experiences. As far as I know, there is no known mechanism that would result in this sort of non-binary dysphoria, as you put it. I suppose if someone was trans and they decided that they didn't want to identify as a male or female because they had elements of both, then I, I guess that could be considered non-binary. Personally, I'm much more interested in the psychology and neurology of it. 
What's going on in the heads of the sorts of people who identify as something like uh, star gender? Which is real, by the way. Look it up. Now, based off my experiences with talking to these sorts of people, it appears to be more of a, a social thing, which brings us into a whole other dimension of gender. Uh, gender is a... a it's a multi-dimensional concept. Um, they, there are multiple ways to measure it and look at it. If we're talking about biology, gender is something that formed around gametes for reproduction. The two gametes, the sperm and the egg, you know, uh, they have very different functions. And we are basically machines that are built around these gametes, intended to allow them, or rather us, to reproduce. Uh, if the whole non-binary thing is strictly a, a social phenomenon, then that makes perfect sense. If we look across time and space, we see a great deal of variation within this social dimension of gender. Uh, even within populations, we see a great deal of variation in gender expression. And I think it's a good thing to sort of question the norms that exist in your culture, whether it be, you know, the, the gender expectations or, you know, or beyond. However, I see many non-binary activists working against the trans community. Uh, one notable example is Riley Dennis. Bay has frequently stated that gender is purely socially constructed, and there's no difference between men and women, and that it's all been conditioned into us. So what do you think they thinks of the countless studies and peer-reviewed papers that not only show the sexual dimorphism in the brain, but also proves the previously hypothesized mechanism causing transgenderism? She goes through the peer-reviewed papers and basically says the same line over and over. It assumes two genders, and it has a sample size that's too small. <laughs> Ironically, uh, Steven Crowder has a similar video where he goes through similar papers and says men are men, women are women, and the sample size is too small. That's... <laughs> they both have the same criticisms of the same papers. Damn it, it happened again. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, I'm working on another video as part of my Bad Arguments Debunked series, which I will tackle this awful criticism towards scientific research, often levied by science deniers, where they ignore the whole thing based off the sample size. It's amazing that such a huge mistake was missed by the multiple people peer-reviewing these papers, but luckily, it was caught by internet personalities. <laughs> the way I see it, the only way to prove non-binary in the biological dimension of gender would be to falsify the research proving the existence of trans people. To answer your question, I would need to turn my back on a group of people who are suffering enough as it is. But that's just assuming that these two groups exist from the same dimension of gender, as many non-binary activists claim which I, I don't think they do. I'd love to do a video on gender going further in depth, emphasizing gender as an extremely complex umbrella term with many different contexts. Oh, and another thing you mentioned was that the ratios can be altered. This is true. What makes us so unique as a species is our brain's incredible ability to rewire itself. This is known as neuroplasticity, but how much we can alter those ratios by doing things like playing 3D platformer games, as done in the original study, is not as much as you seem to be implying. But if you believe that it's possible to make your brain resemble the opposite gender, then I encourage you to try. It's also funny that you would mention the brain's neuroplasticity. In my original video, there are, there are tons of people making the same argument, but they're usually arguing from a more conservative perspective that trans people don't exist and they shouldn't be transitioning. I've always found it interesting that the same argument can be used to support two completely different conclusions. Uh, I suppose the best reputation I can think of would be this. Most trans people were raised by their parents and socialized to be the gender that they appear to be. Assuming that what you are proposing is true, then they should have brains that resemble the gender that they were socialized to be but they don't. So their existence in these studies kind of falsify what you're claiming. These ratios are seen long before puberty, uh, and brain scans are actually used to determine the gender of an intersex person so that the disorder can be corrected, and the person can grow to have a life with all the same opportunities as someone without that condition. This theory allows us to accurately make predictions and help people. And there's actually a, a very sad story that ties into all of this. Uh, there was a psychologist named John Money who believed that gender was fluid and could be changed, similar to what you seem to be claiming. In the 60s, due to the botched circumcision of David Reimer, 
Dr. Money was given permission from David's parents to perform an experiment, which he hoped would prove his ideas. Dr. Money sexually reassigned David, and David was raised as a girl by his parents. Uh, later in life, however, things started going wrong. Um, this experiment that was first thought to be a success later turned out to be a complete disaster, causing extreme dysphoria for David, uh, resulting in his suicide. There's also a lot of fucked up things that went on during this experiment, which I encourage you all to actually look into. It's from people like Dr. Money that we get these silly pseudoscientific ideas from. There are many cases like David's where pseudoscience leads to harm, which is why it's crucial that any rational person should fight against it, in all forms. Never stop questioning things, especially the things that you think you figured out. It's what I do, and that's what brings me to answering your other question. Is there anything that I've changed my mind about? This issue, the one that I was literally just speaking about, I, uh, I used to doubt the existence of trans people, but then I took the time to actually look at the scientific literature to see what research had been done. Um, and it turns out there was a lot that I didn't know about. The evidence was clear, and I changed my mind like that. I hope I was able to answer your question. First, I'll edit in a question later. Reminder, what is your current opinion on the skeptic community? Also, this one's just for fun. Imagine you won $1 billion in the lottery, but aliens arrive on Earth the same day and tell everyone they will destroy the planet in two days. What would you do? Dev, man, how's it going? Dev is an awesome dude. Uh, I hope to have him help run the Discord, um, just as soon as I figure out how to work it. So, what is my thoughts on the skeptic community? Well, that's a good question. Um, based off what I've seen, many conservatives who had kind of cloaked themselves in this label have dropped it. I've seen many new names and faces rise in popularity who call themselves skeptics, uh, with the label in their bios or even in their names sometimes. Uh, these people who perfectly match the definition of what a skeptic is, right? Or they they embody what a skeptic should be. I think the skeptic community is stronger than ever. I, I really do. And as for your other question, if aliens were to invade and kill me in a couple days, I don't think anyone would take my money. So I'd probably do nothing. Wait, no. No, I know what I'd do. I'd take it all, I'd break it up into smaller bills, and I'd get a giant pile of cash, and I'd just sit in the middle of a room, and I'd jump into it like a leaf pile. If the earth is an egg, does that make me a chick? Yes, and you're the cutest of them all. Since you're pretty science-focused, did you, slash are you, going to university? And if so, what's the subject? Yes and yes. I am currently out, but I plan on going back this January if I can afford it. I'll be going back to earn a degree in mechanical engineering. What did you originally intend to make this channel for when you started it? A place to post most of the videos I made, because I like making videos. I, I didn't intend to gain subscribers or viewers, but here we are. What is your opinion on gun control? I am pro arms control. You just shouldn't be allowed to own nukes. That should should be how our, our cities and cars. What is your opinion on the refugee slash migrant crisis affecting Europe? I suggest looking up Oginos. I think I'm reading that right. Oginos. Well, I am currently living in Minnesota where there are quite a few Islamic refugees and I personally haven't seen anything like what you see in the videos you talked about from that guy you recommended. Personally, I think there is legitimacy to some people's concerns, but I really don't want to go any further because I'm not there and I can't comment on something that I haven't experienced. But Islam is an extremely barbaric religion in its purest form, just like all religion. And if you bring a bunch of people who are from another culture that is inherently bigoted and sexist into one full of freedom and equality, there will be a clash, without a doubt. Now, as I've said, I, I haven't seen that here, so, yeah. Why Pure Carbon as your channel name? There's a fun question. So before I created this channel, I was researching artificial muscle because I was building an exoskeletal arm at the time. One way you can make artificial muscle is with carbon nanotubes. I ended up using fishing line muscle instead because I didn't have the tools or the know-how to create the carbon ones. I was also researching a bunch of cool but weird technological advancements at the time, and quite a few of them involved carbon. Carbon, if layered right, is clear and can absorb light, allowing for the production of clear solar panels. It can similarly be used to create night vision as well. 
Carbon can be lighter than a feather, and some carbon nanomaterials are more conductive than gold. This stuff can be stronger than steel. Carbon is in just about everything, and can be found just about everywhere. Carbon in its purest form can do some incredible things. Plus I thought the name sounded cool, so there is that. Don't become a hypocrite, please, we have had enough of those. Can we finally have one guy on this earth who isn't a mental gymnasist? Not saying you are one, but please don't change. Sure, I can do that. <laughs> I think. Thoughts on Fulong Gong? Fulong Gong. That's the weird Chinese cult that combines old Buddhist practices with aliens, right? I, I, I don't know. They, they don't really seem to be hurting anyone, so... Their ideas are BS, but I think they can serve as almost a case study for the Streisand effect. Uh, the way the Chinese government oppresses the followers, along with other religions. Uh, banning something, or forcefully removing something from people, only makes them want it more. And I think that is very interesting. But the, the, the actual group itself, the, the, the cult, religion, whatever you want to call it, is it's just like any other one. I am just here to say, please, for whatever reason, don't quit this channel. I love all of your videos. As a science enthusiast, I follow many science-related channels, but yours is one of the best. As always, keep offending. Oh. Well, that's very nice of you to say. Thank you. Did you do it? Yes. What kind are you wanting? Any. <laughs> Mary Fuck Kill. Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, Alex Jones. Oh, you son of a bitch. Okay. I absolutely can't stand Ben. Uh, he's an obnoxious, condescending prick who is extremely hypocritical. Uh, I definitely would kill Ben. Alex is fucking rich and he has ten times the net worth of Jordan. Plus, he's actually entertaining. <laughs> that, of course, leaves Jordan for the fucking. There you go. You're awful. You're a horrible human being. Fuck you for asking that question. I have a science question for you. Where do we come from and where are we going? Things religions try to answer and science tries to find out the truth on. We came from Stardust. We come from infinity as beings who are closely connected to the universe and are yet so disconnected. We don't know who we are and we probably never will. Wherever we go will be where entropy drives us, disguised as petty desires and material riches. Purpose is but a result of a series of events and a chain reaction set into motion from the great expansion. Where we go is the only place that we can go, and that is forward. Never stopping, never ending, never ceasing, following the destructive path of creation into the endless. Nah, but seriously, we're gonna destroy everything and then build it back up. It'll be fun. You'll see. What do you think of this song? I like it. I really like it. It's it's a good, good song. It has a, a sort of indie grunge sound to it. Have you ever read Nietzsche? Holy shit! You ask a lot of questions. <laughs> I haven't read anything from Friedrich Nietzsche, but I'm familiar with some of his work. I I agree with his take on religion as being sort of a debilitating thing that is almost drug-like. Uh, People use it to numb pain and cover up problems, and, as opposed to solving them. I don't really agree with his ideas regarding drugs and alcohol, though. His views on drugs and alcohol are very similar to that of religion, but I think religion is based around a delusion where drugs are purely used for pleasure. They both give pleasure and they can both be addictive, but religion is very different from something like alcohol because of that delusional factor. Do you ever lose friends over your very straightforward, no bullshit opinions? Do you value friendships that depend on pretense? No. I actually feed my friends little bits of information to slowly change their minds so that they think exactly like me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, no, but seriously, uh, I haven't really lost any friends to my opinions. And uh, a friendship that depends on pretense is like a, a castle built on sand. It, it's doomed to fail. Do you like Radiohead? Radiohead. Some of their songs I like, but I, I wouldn't call myself a fan. What are your thoughts on the halal meat? 
Oh, you mean the meat that comes from animals who are basically tortured and slaughtered right in the streets by having their throats slit until they bleed to death. Um, yeah, that, that sort of stuff makes slaughterhouses look humane. It's horrible. Awful stuff. What's your favorite paradox? I would have to say that my favorite paradox would be the old ship paradox. Um, if you slowly remove all the pieces from an old ship while well, replacing them, and then after you've replaced the whole ship, you take all the old parts, put them back together, so that you have the same ship, you know, which one is the original? I think that is such a such an interesting question to ask. And I also like it because uh, it brings up questions of what are we? Who are we? Because in theory, you should be able to do the same thing with us. It takes seven years to completely replace all the cells in your body. So, theoretically, if you were to take all the old dead cells over a seven-year span, put them all together in the exact spot that they originally were in, and then you regenerated them somehow, um, would this new being be you, or would you be you? I think questions like that are <laughs> really, really interesting. What's your opinion on philosophy as a discipline? I've noticed that some very scientifically-minded people are very dismissive of it, refusing to consult philosophical literature, while at the same time trying to answer philosophical questions. This results in them using very amateurish, self-made vocabulary, stumbling over thoughts that have been thought a million times before by better philosophers than them. You can probably glean my opinion on the matter now, but what's your take? That's a very good, but complicated question. Let me start off by giving you my opinion, then I'll explain why I think scientifically minded people like Krauss or Bill Nye or Richard Dawkins are so dismissive of it. I believe that philosophy is just as, if not more important than science, especially now. Uh, there was a time when philosophers were very common, were sought after by the general public, and played a, a great role in politics. But that's, that's no longer the case. In our world as it currently sits, there are many questions that we need to sort out. And I think philosophy is exactly what this world needs. I think it's in Norway where the government employs philosophers to figure out the ethics of harvesting resources in their country. More specifically, the people determine the potential consequences and benefits of carving up the land for oil. Uh, that's just one example, and I think the rest of the world could follow in the footsteps of countries like these, who take the time to think and question before they just jump in. But with that said, that won't happen if the public perception doesn't change. I think when people think philosophy, they immediately go to ancient Greece with a bunch of people with gray beards sitting around discussing why people have fingers or the importance of the philosopher's stone. Now this, this sort of view kind of ties into why so many scientists or science communicators constantly bash philosophy as a discipline. I think it's partly because most people don't truly understand what philosophy is or what it can be used for. They probably view it as an old way of understanding the world and finding answers to questions. Many of these people are extremely passionate about science, and they obviously see a great deal of value in science. Which is wonderful. I, I think we should all have love for science, but this can serve as somewhat of a blind spot. There's a, a scene from Jurassic Park that I'm reminded of by this question of philosophy, and that's one where they're all sitting in the room at a table just after being given the tour, and Dr. Malcolm gives a little rant about his problems with the park, and he says something along the lines of, uh, we were too busy asking if we could that we forgot to ask if we should. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. That line kind of embodies this whole science versus philosophy discussion. If you praise one set of questions and answers, but not the other, then that's just silly. Science serves to answer some questions, while philosophy answers others. It's a, a false dichotomy to try and say that one is better than the other, or one is more important than the other. The other reason why I think these people like to bash philosophy uh, is because of the way some people, who are often even more ignorant of philosophy, seek to answer scientific questions with philosophy. For example, it's common for many evangelicals to make moral or emotional arguments to prove God exists. Like, uh, existence is meaningless without God, therefore there must be one. Or uh, something like, we have morals, and these morals can only exist if they are grounded in something transcendent. You know, shit like that, right? I think stuff like that kind of leaves a, a bad taste in the mouths of many for philosophy. And I think that's that's 
the case in people like Bill Nye or Richard Dawkins, who said in his book The Selfish Gene, Philosophy and the subjects known as the humanities are still taught today as though Darwin had never lived. No doubt this will change in time. Ignore the politics and social issues that it can help us with. We are on the cusp of scientific advancements that would be considered magic just a few short years ago. Many of these advancements, like most things, come with strings attached. If we don't critically examine the possible consequences of new discoveries and technologies, we could unknowingly be releasing a genie from the bottle. And once it's out, there's no putting it back in. Not too long ago, you and I were having a chat about transhumanism, or specifically we were talking about... or you had tweeted that CRISPR has the potential to enhance us, uh, as well as heal us, and I had brought up uh, potential issues that might arise from the recreational use of that sort of technology. What would happen if criminals could swap out a few genes here or there? Uh, they, they would change their skin or hair color, you know, they, they could reshape their faces to whatever they want. How would you prove guilt in a court or even disprove accusations? If people were to swap genes with plants or even animals, you know, we'd be making it easier for different diseases to hop species. Or, or what about genetic enhancements, as you stated in our discussion? You know, um, everyone has the capability to improve themselves and their children. Wouldn't that lead to an arms race? Would something like this destroy group identity through things like race or gender? Or would it allow us to create more subgroups to divide into, creating more conflict? I know you're against tribalism and identity politics. Would, would more tools to paint on the human canvas free us to finally be individuals? Or would we simply construct more cages to lock ourselves in? It's questions like these surrounding issues like these where I see philosophy making a big return to our modern world. But those are just my views on philosophy. Um, you're the philosopher, aren't you? Do I have it right, or am I just talking shit? What are your thoughts? You know, maybe you should make a video on it, Mr. I want to be a YouTuber. Thank you all for watching, and I hope I was adequately able to answer all of your questions. I've never made a video like this before, so it was it was a bit of a learning curve, you know. I, but I had fun, uh, and I hope you enjoyed watching. Uh, thank you all for supporting my channel and my insanity. Um, <laughs> And for the 1,500 plus people who subscribed after I released my Ask Me Questions video, I'll get you next time.